Let's turn our Bibles to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. The title of the message is, No Christian Needs to Sin. No Christian Needs to Sin. No Christian Needs to Sin. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. So again, before I start, please pray for those who are not doing well physically, right? You know, you know Sister Jisun, Sister Jenny, you know, Sister Eve, and you know, Sister Jan, you know, everybody. They definitely need your prayers. Yes. You know, we're all part of the body of Christ. Yes. So whoever I miss, continue to pray those people. You just don't know unless you or your loved ones go through those right. you know, real illness, sickness. You know, it won't hit you as hard, but you know you ought to understand what your brethren are going through, and continuously praying for them. Not just when you hear from me on Sunday or Wednesday, you have to pray every single day. Amen. With that, let's look at our verses today. First Peter chapter one, verse fourteen: As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Brother Jay, can you please pray for the message? Thank you once again for saving us from hell by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, whereby we are sealed until the day of redemption. Thank you for your work in the Bible that you have preserved unto us. We ask you that you help us to be attentive to your work. Please fill Pastor Jay with the Holy Spirit, given the liberty and the power and authority to declare your work to us. <coughs> Open our hearts, minds, and ears to your work. Help us to learn from your work. Help us to live a more godly, more holy life yes. after hearing this message. And for those who are listening, please online, please be with them as well. Bless them and provide the things that they need. Protect us from devil's attacks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So no Christian needs to sin. So when we look at our text verses today, especially verse 16, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. You know, it's coming from Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. You know, you and I can't be sinless, but we need to live as sinless as possibly as we can so that our, we could be, you know, we could give our service to the Lord. Yes. A lot of times, Christians tend to forget that your conversation is spoken in verse 15. It's not just manner of just talking. It's conduct of life. So every part of your life should be holy. And in the sight of Almighty God, who saved you from hell, you should be holy as much as possible. And that does not include only on Sundays. That does not include only on you know, church activity days. It needs to be every single day of your life. If you don't do that, then what's going to happen? Sin will engulf your life, and sin will control your life. Once sin controls your life, what happens is that you can't think of anything else. You're supposed to read your Bible, but you don't read your Bible. Why? Because of sin. Yes. Because that thing on your head is just consuming you, whatever it is. I mean, how do I know? Because I go through it on a daily basis. It's time for you to read the Bible. It's time for you to study. It's time for you to, you know, spend time with the Lord, but you don't do it. Why? Because there's certain sin in your life is constantly stopping you from going forward. You and I should never be a backward Christians. Always going backwards. You and I should be going forward. I mean, when we see this, you know, I go straight to point number one. Point number one is no Christian needs to sin. That's right away. Amen. There's no sin in the world where you have to commit. 24 hours from now. There's no sin you have to commit one week from now or one month from now. There's no sin as a Christian 
you and I needs to commit. It's your justification that makes you commit those sins. Yeah. Right? You don't need to look at certain things, but why do you look at it? Right. You don't need to go to certain places. Why do you go? Why do you participate in activities that you know for sure will lead you to sin? Let's go to a few verses today. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Now, many of you know this verse by heart. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Again, no Christian needs to sin. You don't have to sin. Why are you engulfed in sin in your life? Even if it's little ones, you know, little things will always grow. Yeah. Especially when it comes to sin, guarantee you it's going to go exponentially faster than doing good works. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. The Bible says, There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to men. But God is faithful. The Bible says God is faithful. Yes. Who will not suffer you to be tempted of all that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. There's no temptation in the world where you cannot bear, where you cannot avoid, where you cannot run away from. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. You know, people, like all the new versions, change this verse. I've discussed it in the past. There's reason. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. The Bible says abstain from it. What's the best way to abstain from it? Do and be like Joseph when he was dealing with Potiphar's wife. Just run away. Run away from sin. Just run. Avoid it. There's no reason for you to go through it because that temptation is going to be greater and harder. So avoid it. You know, all the new versions change this verse because they want to enjoy it. They want to go through it. Oh, you know, the Bible says I should... You know, go through it. No, you don't go through it. When it comes to sin, you have to avoid it. Right. Abstain from it once and for all. So if those sinful thoughts come your way, you have to run away from it. Yes. Right? Well, why do you have to dwell on it? Why do you have to experience it? You know, experience is such a horrible thing when it comes to, you know, Word of God this day and age. You know, every charismatic assembly of God, you know, every, you know, Mixed up religions, they all say you need to have some experience. What experience, right? You just need the perfect word of God. Amen. So this one is right out of, you know, Dr. Reckman's, you know, commentary. I don't want to miss any word. So I'm going to say it verbatim. And Wednesday people kind of heard it. So if you want to stay right with the Lord, if you want to grow as a Christian, because you will never amount to anything if you don't grow as a Christian. You're just going to be no good Christian the rest of your life. So this is the quote. The easiest way to stay right with God. Again, the easiest way to stay right with God is by a constant exposure to sin-hating, Bible-believing, blasting, skating, loud, clear, plain preaching from a man who believes the book. Amen. Not someone who uses the book. You and I believe the book yes. wholeheartedly, King James Bible. Yeah. So if you want to stay right with the Lord, easiest way, exposure yeah. to constant sin-hating preaching, yes. Bible-believing preaching, blasting preaching, skating preaching, loud, clear preaching, plain preaching. Amen. You have to constantly hear it. Yeah. That's why our church is different. We're not like Joel Austin's of the world, Saddlebacks of the world, Calvary Chapels of the world. We are not going to, you know, crater to your needs, right? As in for your pleasure. You are here. I'm here to change. We need that strong preaching. We need sin-hating preaching. And if it gets to you, that's a good thing. Holy Spirit is convicting you. What are you going to do about it when that does happen? Right? I don't know. A lot of preachers have different styles of preaching. You know, if you go to blowout, you could go to meetings, jubilees. You know, some people you know, tend to you know, have an intro and then just have a storytelling. Right? You know, 
Our style is a little different, especially if you listen to my preaching or Pastor Kim's preaching. We just go straight to your sin and my sin. That's it. We don't need to sugarcoat anything, right? Because if you don't do it, if you and I don't constantly hear it, what's going to happen? We can't live holy. God is holy. You want to strive as much as you can to live holy. So point number one, no Christian needs to sin. If you have decided to not commit that sin for 10 minutes and you accomplish that by the grace of God because of the Lord's mercy, then make it a 15-minute next. Amen. Make it a 30-day next, yes. right? So, I mean, a common example, right? You know, we use drugs, right? Yes. And hopefully no one's doing drugs right now. Here, Amen. if you are, you have hope in the Lord, right? Thank you, Lord. So don't do it for 15 minutes. Don't do it for 30 minutes. Yeah. Don't do it for a whole day. Try it. Don't do it for a week. Yep. But if you do fall, you have to get up again. Yes. Right? Don't give up. Continue and continue and continue so that you could live a day or two as sinless as possible. That's good. I mean, when was last time you even measured that? When was last time you actually had it on your head? You know, today I'm going to live as sinless as possible, but not your own will or anything, your you know, strength or your no. you know, knowledge and righteousness, but because by grace of God, relying on the Lord. Yes. When was the last time you lived a day, whole day, 24-7, as sinless as possible. That's good, preacher. If you haven't, then you, you, you don't even know the meaning of be holy for I am holy, right? Right. I mean, that's a command from the Lord. Oh, yeah. He didn't say, try your best not to be, you know. <laughs> no, just like 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself. It's not doing your best to study. You know, every new version has changed it. Imperative, command. Yes. You do because I told you so. I mean, that's the greatest thing about, you know, Bible and how the Lord works things. He said, do it. It's up to you. Free will. Simple as that. You don't want to do it? That's a disobedience. You do it? That's obedience, right? I mean, going back to our text verses, you know, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14, as obedient children. You want to obey, Right? You know, obey is better than sacrifice, right? You have to obey. Obey at all times. Not just, you know, when you feel like it. Not just when you are stirred up. When you don't want to obey, you still have to obey, right? That's the hardest thing to do, right? When you're so tired, when you're dreary, weary, and you're emotionally, you know, spent because of affairs of this world, you still have to obey. Yes. You know, there's no reason for you not to obey, though, right? Right. Because you don't have to commit that sin. No Christian needs to sin. Amen. No, I think it's the worst justification when you and I bring up to the Lord, Lord, I had no other option. And Lord goes, did you read 1 Corinthians 10, 13? No, right? Didn't. You know, I gave you the word, yeah. right? We always constantly trying to give with excuses. So there's an illustration. I think it's pretty good, right? So there's a prisoner. Prisoners are, you know, in a jail, prison cell. And prison door opens. And then there's an announcement in the PA system. Because you're free. You're free to go. But prisoners are like, that can't be true. You know, I've done so many worse things. I can't, I can't. And self-righteousness start coming in. You know, doors open. I don't know about you. I mean, by grace of God, you know, I never spent a day in the prison. But if you've ever spent even a single day in prison, it's bad. It's horrible. It's, It's one thing that parents always say to their children. Don't go to prison. I don't want to, you know, consult you, you know, behind that glass, you know, talking to you. So, it's open, but people just don't go out. Spiritually speaking, Christians, you and I are free from sin once and for all. Amen. We were in that prison yes. of damnation and on our way to hell. Yes. And Lord says he opened the door by sacrificing his yes. life for us. Thank you, Lord. Why are you still sitting there? 
you got to leave that sin once and for all. Yes. If this is your prison cell, doors open, you say, sayonara, right? Yeah. Adios, and then you just leave yeah. once and for all. Why do Kore- I mean, Koreans, right? I'm a Korean. Why do Christians, right, always get stuck in the prison and just stay there forever? Yeah. You, you have to understand that in order for me not to sin anymore, you just have to leave. Yes. And don't come back. Amen. And the worst thing is the repeat offenders, right? Yeah. They commit burglary. They commit rape. They commit all kinds of wicked sins. And they do it again. Yeah. And they go back. You and I are same. That's good. We do it over and go back. Yeah. I mean, Lord says you're free once and for all. I mean, why do I want to go back? Mm-hmm. But man, our wicked flesh is constantly attacking us. Devils attacking us, right? The world's attacking us. Yeah. So you have to understand that whenever those temptations come, you know what? I don't have to do it. I'd rather obey the Lord than you, the devil, the world, and the flesh. Amen. No Christian needs to sin. Point number two, no Christian needs to share in the world's style. Right? No Christian needs to share in the world's style. And this one, I'm going to get a lot of hate for it. It doesn't matter, but the Bible says it. Right? right? Yeah. Either, either you go with the Bible or you don't go with the Bible. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Whether you're here, whether you're listening, you might not agree with my opinion, but don't know, do not disagree with the Word of God. 1 Timothy chapter... Uh, first, did I say first? Yeah, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 9. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 9. Nine. Some people don't come to our church because of this verse. I'll tell you that right off the bat. But we need people who's willing to wholeheartedly follow the word of God, Amen. not just the portions. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, yes. not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. No Christian needs to share in the world's style in their dresses. That's good. Yes. Modesty. I'll tell you what modest is. Modest is that which does not attract attention. Yes. Modesty is what? Is that which does not attract attention. We say it, you know, you heard this term, Sunday best, Sunday best, right? You dress Sunday best, right, when you come to church. Because why? You're here worshiping Almighty God together. People are so, how should I say, brainwashed. You know, you should be free, right? That's why Calvary Chapel and Saddleback is so popular. You could come to church in your shorts, your flip-flops, your pajamas, right? Women come to church dressed like a bikini, you know, you know, showing all the skin in the whole world, right? That's not how you fear God. That's not how you respect God and honor God. I mean, even in public places, they have coals right there. I mean, public schools. You don't see them just going there like showing all their skin. You don't see people go to workplace. But why at church people have problem dressing modestly? Preach. Why? You can't do it for work. You can't do it for schools. You can't do it for events. Yes. If there's a black tie event, I guarantee you, you're not going to go there with a t-shirt and jeans. But you consider that more important than serving and worshiping and praising God in the congregation of brothers and sisters, body of Christ. I'm not saying like, you know, there's a certain thing you have to abide by completely because if I give a rule, then people will always find the way to break it. Like if I were to tell you, okay, cover yourself on, you know, down the knee to ladies, you're going to find tight clothes. 
like a scuba diving clothes to make sure that you are revealed. Guys too, right? Yes. You know, you wear some stuff that's gonna just pop out, you know, with just one flex of your muscle, right? You know? It is modesty, something that will not attract attention. So you have to pray about it. If you do have a question, you know, there's, you know, pastors, wives, you know, teachers, preachers, you ask, right? And there's a process. You have to grow. We completely understand. None of us going to go up to you and say, leave the church <laughs> because you wore a earring today, you know, for a guy, you know. No. You know, there are babes in Christ who needs to, Amen. who takes time, yes. right? We're not going to, you know, damn people like that, right? But we can't condone it, right? Right, right. You know, we want you to grow out of it, yes. right? I mean, if you've been coming to church 20, 25 years, and then you come with a, you know, short shorts, you know, I'm talking about both men and women, yeah. you know, this day and age, right? right? You know, with a, what do you call that, spaghetti thing, and then just showing yourself to everybody? <laughs> that is not modest, right? Amen. You know how serious Lord is about this? Let's go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. It says, man and woman, you have to understand. You have to dress modestly. You dress your best for the Lord. And it's a farce that you could dress your best for everything outside of serving the Lord. And you don't do it for the Lord. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. So you and I agree that adultery is one of the worst sins yes. a person can commit, besides from like murdering. Verse 28, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Amen. Think about it. So it's two-way street. A lot of times this person committed adultery already with the woman in his heart yeah. because of the way people are dressed, yes. the way women are dressed, yeah. right? So you have to think. You have to really be careful how you dress, yes. right? Because if you don't do it, again, you know, this Sermon on the Mount, you know, it's not going to, you have to doctrinally apply it there. But spiritually, there's always a spiritual application you could make, right? Yeah. That's why you have to be careful, right? But if you have a rebellious heart, you're like, you know what? I don't care. I'm just going to dress however I want. Then go to somewhere else. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't know. How are you going to listen to this type of preaching over and over and over and feel like, oh, I'm at the right place, right? If you can't abide by local church, and their, you know, standards and policy and how we follow the word of God. I always say, doors wide open. Go somewhere else where it's accepted, right? Yes. Some Baptists out there, Presbyterian, Catholic Church, you know, Saddleback, Calvary. Just go there, enjoy yourself, and put some tattoos on it while you're at it, Ooh. right? You know, you know, put some Bible verses there, you know, Wicked. and then suddenly, you know, head to toe, you know, your walking Bible tattoo, and deliberately disobeying, you know, not marking yourself according to the word of God. But this is what's happening yes. in a Christian world and realm. So think about it. Just do what the Bible says. Be modest. You look at yourself in the mirror. Am I going to attract attention today? Right? If you say no, you prayed about it, that's good. But even if there's a hint, am I going to attract attention today? Then don't do it. Men should dress like man. Women should dress like woman. Yes. Simple as that. Yes. In this day and age, with all this gender equality, man, this, I mean, I can't understand how a six foot two, 250 pound man comes to somewhere with a dress yeah. and saying that I'm a woman. Yeah. No, you're a man. Yes. I mean, you're, you're transvestite. That's what the term. I don't think they even use that anymore, right? You know, it's a it's a legal word, 
nowadays, you know, but that's what it is. So again, you know, you want to be modest the way you dress where it does not attract attention. And you can't, you got to avoid, you know, worldly style of music. Amen. Yes. You know, Christians are so into music. I understand. Be in godly music. Yes. There it is. Godly music, yes. right? You know, godly music. No contemporary Christian stuff. No rock and roll, right? No rap. Trash. You know, they're not godly. No. So best thing to do is just listen to melodies, right? You take all the words out. How does it sound, right? Okay. Does it sound with a bunch of drums and worldly beats, right? You know, like our, when we sing hymns, your body doesn't start dancing, right? I mean, but certain worldly songs, it's all about pleasing your soul. It's not spiritual. Right. That's why they could jump up and down for one whole hour like a concert. Yes. Right? And they have this worldly crying. Tears come out. Because they're so emotionally, you know, yes. entwined with that music. But let's see what the Bible says. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. We'll start with verse 16. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. So no Christian needs to share in the world's style. Think about your testimony. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What does that mean? A lot of Christians will fulfill the lust of flesh all the time. It's a warning. Verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that he cannot do the things that he would. Bible clearly says there's something that spirit likes, there's something that flesh likes. When it comes to music, there's no in-between. Spiritual songs and hymns and music and worldly songs, carnal songs and music. If you are going to stay in that worldly music, you're going to be destroyed. Simple as that, right? You stay with the worldly style, you will reap what you sow completely. I, I shared this testimony before a long time ago. So... Right after I got saved and, you know, I found the truth and started coming to our church, I still had some, you know, worldly stuff in me. And, and this was like the first six months, you know, after I started coming to our church. And, you know, I had some still worldly friends, you know. I went to pick up my brother at high school. And, you know, I was a confession good for the soul, but I was like back in 1998 or 99 was listening to some worldly music station. So I picked up my brother, friend was on the seat. I was coming out, and then boom, car just hit me, you know, car hit me. And I realized, okay, okay, Lord, I got the message, you know. I mean, ever since then, I've never heard any, you know, worldly music since then. But Lord's gonna get your attention one way or the other, right? If you are listening to bad music, the Lord's going to give you a warning. Because that's one of the worst things to happen to a Christian, be binded, you know, a slave to worldly music. Yes. And don't think that because you're listening to some Jesus lyrics in a worldly music, it's okay. It's not okay, no. like I said. Spirit is against that flesh thing. So if you haven't struggling with worldly music, again, you turn away from and turn to godly music. Amen. Don't just be like, okay, I'm going to turn it off. I'm going to throw it away. And you have nothing to replace it. Yeah. You're going to go back to it. Yeah. So you got to start replace it with godly music, godly, you know, classical music. I mean, Handel, Bach, they wrote music to glorify God. Listen to it. Hallelujah, right? Yeah. Listen to it. 
instead of going back to all this contemporary stuff, it's trash. Yes. It's junk. Yes. And it's only going to pollute your mind, right? But you're like, oh, you know, I'm so weak, you know? Don't give me that self-pity. I mean, you're not that weak. Right. When you're willing to commit those sins, you're really good at it. Yeah. You know, you're like a forefront, God. man. Yeah, you could win that race, yeah. you know. The, you know, <laughs> whether it's a short race or long race, marathon, you are able to commit that sin for a long, long time. Where does strong strength come from? It's from you, yeah. your flesh. So in the spirit, you could also have a lot of strength and then defeat it, right? Yes. Don't try to do it on your own again. Rely on the Lord. Rely on the word of God. Rely on good preaching. Rely on your prayers Amen. and fellowship with the Lord. And get rid of it once and for all. Yes. Right? Your car shouldn't be your worldly sanctuary. Just because you don't listen to it at home, so that because you don't want to show that self to your wife, your husband, your children, but you know, car is the only thing that you drive and you're alone time with you, doesn't excuse you from listening to devilish movie. Right. I mean I mean music. I mean, that's another story, right? Yeah, I mean, you're just listening to it. And then you become emotional. Those things make you very emotional. Oh, man, stupid love songs, right? And then you start thinking about your world, I mean, you know, worldly affairs. You know, those wicked things that you shouldn't think about. I mean, you're a married person. Oh, makes me think about the flings that I had in the past, right? And then that's when danger comes. There it is. You go to your what? You go to your Facebook, you know, Twitter. You go to some other social media. Oh, let me see. Let me see how they're doing. You know, I want to witness to them. Liar. <laughs> I mean, uh, using God's name to do that. No, you're doing it because you want to fulfill the lust of your flesh. Amen. That's why. Go get rid of it. Once and for all. What's the whole purpose and desire of those music? So that you could commit sin. Yes. That's right. I mean, what's the whole point? I mean, those rap music, you heard it before, they want to kill all the cops in the world. Yeah. I mean, what good is that? There are good cops out there, people. Right. Yeah. They're supposed to protect yeah. and serve. Yeah. Don't get swayed by those little things out there and all those, you know, wicked protesters out right. there. No. You know. And as a Christian, you're supposed to, you know, obey the ordinances of the, yeah. you know, yes. society and the law. Yes. As long as it's, you know, godly, right? Yes. You have to do it. And you put yourself in that situation over and over, just tells me and tells you and tells the Lord that you're not serious about it. Mm-hmm. You're not serious about your sins. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. I discussed that on Wednesday. Hebrews chapter 12. Here in chapter 12. No Christian needs to sin, but there's going to require some effort on your end. There's going to require your desire, your passion, and everything that's in you in order to accomplish that. And you could only do it in the Lord. And you see some examples. Let's look at verse 3. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. For consider him that endures such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Verse 4. I mean, do you really do this, Christians? Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Did you actually fight against sin until blood started coming out of your pores? No. When the Lord was praying at Gethsemane, bearing all the sins of the world, yours and mine, I mean, blood was pouring. Yeah. Sweat drops of blood. That's serious stuff. Yes, when was the last time you actually fought against sin until your life depended on it? Like, you know what? It's life or death for me. You know, if it's life or death, you're not going to do it. If it's going to kill you. Right. If you know there's a train coming at you, unless you're suicidal and you want to die and you want to live, you're going to stay away from that track. Yes, right. When the train comes, you're going to move away as fast as you can. Yes. Especially if you can see it, that means it's going to get here very soon. Yes. 
When it comes to sin, right? when was the last time you resisted unto blood? Literally. Striving against sin. You're fighting against sin. And you're not, I mean, even if you, you, I mean, even if you die, you're not going to commit that sin. Think about the martyrs. Every Christian should read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Read what they had to do. They are the great examples of verse 4. They resisted unto blood and their life. They gave their life. A lot of them were tur- tortured beyond human imagination. But they did not recant Lord Jesus Christ. They did not say no to Lord Jesus Christ. They stood up for Lord Jesus Christ, and they actually proclaimed and praised him while they're burning at the stake. They gave their life because they were striving against sin, and they resisted. I would submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. You have to resist. That's one character that Christians are really lacking, so-called Bible believers. You can't resist. You don't have a backbone. You're not a man. You know, Bible says, quit you like man. Whenever something hard comes your way, you just fall. You just melt away like that snowman out there. You just become a liquid instead of standing firm in what you believe in the perfect word of God. You have to understand it's a battle, spiritual battle. Yeah. Devil wants to kill you every moment like a roaring lion whom he may devour. And lions are scary beings. You hear you know, stories in Africa you know, where lion just mauls people to death, right? That's like the devil. You think when lion's looking at you, he's like, oh, I want to be his friend. No, lion wants to destroy you and eat you alive. That's what devil is. He wants to destroy you and eat you alive. Why aren't you sober and vigilant when it comes to sin? You and I have to be reminded over and over and over. Because me, you, we're all such a weakling. If we let go of our mind for even a few seconds, few minutes away from the minds of Christ, we fall into sin. Yes. I mean, because even right now, because I was in your shoes, right? Sitting in the pews, right? Some of you are just thinking about what to eat, you know? What are we going to do tonight? You know, how long is this message is going to last, right? You know, when are we going to pray? You know, when he's going to go somewhere else, you know, some different topic. Or like, oh, I'm thinking about work tomorrow, you know, it's a dreading or any. So all those things are coming to your head. But you have to focus. You have to put your heart. I mean, look at verse 2. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You have to look unto Jesus Christ the whole time. Think about this illustration. If you and I were like diamonds, and people love diamonds, right? And then because it's shiny, sparkling, it's very nice, right? But what Christians do is they muddy it up. They put mud on top of it, top of it, top of it. So you can't shine. Lord said, let your... You know, you have to shine in this world, right? You lose that brightness. Then what happens? You cannot be a good testimony to your brethren, but especially to lost world out there. Someone asks, you know, someone's, uh, there's always people who go extreme. You know, the conversation is conduct of life. So I'm going to show people that I'm a Christian by my conduct, but they don't do conversation part. You have to talk. Have you ever talked to people about Lord Jesus Christ at all? Then they're going to look at your conduct very closely. Yeah. If you do not talk about Lord Jesus Christ, if you do not witness, then they're going to look at you as a just self-righteous churchgoer. So think through. It goes hand in hand. Obviously, your conduct of life should show that you're a Christian. But there's got to be that talking part. Because some people will say, you know, I mean, I try to live holy, and it just nothing's working out, you know. Because have you talked about Lord Jesus Christ? 
Have you preached the gospel to others? You don't? Then they're just going to look at you like a self-righteous Christian. That's it. So you have to have a balance. You have to have a balance. And thirdly, point number three, so no Christian needs to sin, no Christian needs to share in the world's style, and no Christian needs to show the world's behavior. Don't show worldly behaviors, right? You might not show it here at church, but outside of church, I wonder how you are. You know, most common criticism that Christian families get is, especially head of the household, they act different outside of church. They get angry. They yell at people. And the children is like looking at, that's not my dad at church. That's not my mom at church. Why are they so different? Yes. You become hypocrites. Yes. You have to make sure that you don't show worldly behaviors. Right. You're like the most meek, gentle people at church. Because I don't see you guys get angry. I don't see you guys, you know, arguing with each other. Man, outside of church, you're like a coal on fire. Yes. You're, like, you're hotter than the hot potato. I mean, you, all you do is just get angry for every little thing, right? That's not a, and I know you're not righteously angry, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's such a bad testimony, Christian. Amen. Especially man. You know, if you have anger problem, you have to resolve it. Yes. Go to the Lord. The right? Bible says, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, right? Amen. And then one time, you know, one of the preachers used to say, people who have anger issues are usually people who have lust problems. You are angry, you better watch out. If you haven't committed anything yet, you're going to commit it. Because something in your life is making you act like that. And usually, that goes hand in hand with the lust, right? Angry people, watch out. You're full of wrath. You might be addicted to pornography. You might be addicted to extramarital affairs. You might be addicted to a lot of stuff that you're trying to hide. Yeah. And I'm talking specifically to men because men have these issues. Yes. Because you think you're macho. And deep inside, if you were to do a forensic dive on your computer, on your phones, your everything else, I can't, I'm sure it's going to come out. Yes. Because you're an angry man, angry Christian, who is very lustful. And nowadays, you know, women are following the lead as well. So, you, like, those things. Don't show worldly behavior. If you have that issue, go to the Lord and resolve it. Ask the Lord to help you. That's why you don't need to be angry. If you aren't angry for five minutes, then you don't have to be angry for 10 minutes. You don't have to be angry for 20 minutes. You don't need to be angry for one day, Amen. right? I mean, if they bless from our Lord Jesus Christ, they talk, you know, bad thing about the King James Bible and stuff, you could get angry. Righteous anger is there. But rest of the things, there's no reason. You look like a fool. Yeah. When third party is looking at you, so-called Christian, Bible-believing Christian from BBCI, you're a fool. What a bad testimony. And you should never cuss. Amen. Why Bible believers cuss, I don't understand. What constitutes worldly behavior this day? From young to old, starting from real young age, elementary school, they constantly cuss. Every other word is F word. I, got, I was shocked one time I was playing basketball at a park, and these are all junior high and high school kids. Every other word is cuss word. But that's a common theme. As a Bible-believing Christian, do not cuss. Yeah. I know you wouldn't do it inside the church. If, if you do, I, mean, I have to talk to you right away. But outside the church, when I'm not looking, when other brethren aren't looking, even though the Lord's inside of you, even though you're in his watchful eye, you just do it. What's your conversation? Yeah. Only let the gospel of Christ and good things come out instead of those wicked things. Yeah. Watch it. Man, when are you ever going to grow? You have to grow. Your goal should be to grow as a Christian. Grow and grow and grow. Why do you always want to stall and get shorter and shorter and shorter? There, is anybody in this room who wants to get shorter and shorter and shorter the rest of your life? No. You talk to maybe seven footers. Even then, they don't want to go too short. Right? 
So grow. You have to grow. You and I have to understand, we're like that light bulb to this world. Amen. Yes. The room is totally dark. Yes. And that light bulb turns on, and then what happens? It dispels all the darkness. Like when, if we were dark right now, we turn the lights off, it's totally dark. But when the lights are turned on, all the darkness disappears, right? It doesn't blend in with the dark space. Christians should never blend in with the dark spaces. You are the light of the world. You are to completely show Jesus Christ to this lost world out there. But if your behavior does not change, think about it. Behavior starts from your heart. So if your heart does not change, forget it. And you should never behave in a way contrary to your heart. Don't just be faking about it. Don't be a hypocrite, right? Don't be a gentle, kind, you know, loving Christian in front of Christians, but you're the worst human being at home. Don't do that. Or at work or anywhere else. Be same. And it has to come from your heart. Think about your testimony. Your testimony a lot of times determines this unsaved people around you whether they want to hear about gospel of Christ or not. You call yourself light of, you know, this wicked world out there, but you're same with them, you know, showing darkness in your life. If I'm other, you know, non-saved person, why would I want to listen to you? Yeah. You're just like me. So there no Christian needs to show the world's behavior. And lastly, no Christian needs to seek the world's approval. I said, lastly, no Christian needs to seek the world's approval. Let's go to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. If your life's goal is to seek approval from the world, you're going to commit sin constantly. You're going to share in the world's lifestyle. And you're going to show world's behavior. Simple as that. Because you want to approve the world. Or you want to get approval from the world, right? That's why peer pressure is very dangerous. Yeah. Like, especially, you know, young people. Oh, they love how I dress like this. You know, I become popular like this. Who do you want to, who do you want to appease? Who do you want to I mean, get approval from? The world, your peers, or from God. Galatians 1.10, the Bible says, For do I now persuade man or God? Or do I seek to please man? Too many Christians want to seek to please man. You and I have to really rethink, examine ourselves. Why do we live? Do we want to seek and please man or do we want to please God? For if I yet please man, I should not be the servant of Christ. You and I should be pleasing Christ every single day, every moment. Amen. We're the ambassador of Christ. Yes. Right? We have a homeland up there, right? Amen. We're representing, you know, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know, our capital is New Jerusalem, yeah. right? Yeah. It's not Washington, D.C. That's right. As a U.S. citizen, yeah, but we're looking at higher than that, right? right? So you want to see approval that comes from God in all your behaviors, all your conversation. So you want to act according to your homeland. Right? That's it. Lord gave us that constitution. Amen. Lord gave us the law. Amen. This King James Bible, perfect word of God. Amen. Then you and I don't need to seek the world's approval. Again, I'm not saying that you go out of your way and, you know, disrupt things. No. Glory is not, you know, God of confusion. You do it orderly. You do your best as unto the Lord. That's what whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Then you are seeking Lord's approval because you're doing it as if to the Lord. Then you, all these things you think is impossible becomes possible in the Lord. You and I, again... In conclusion, you know, we don't have to sin. No Christian needs to sin. You sin because of your fleshly desires, your lust, love of the world, and everything else that goes against the word of God. Yeah. Then what do you have to do? First John 1, 
9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You have to get right with the Lord. And just like the previous week's preaching, like Proverbs 24, 16, you have to get up again. For a just man falls seven times and rises up again. You have to rise up again. And you have to march on and go continuously. Or else, you, shouldn't, you will never become Christian who tries and strives to live sinless as possible, to live holy, and to please God. Again, you and I can never live sinless life. But we can strive to be that servant of the Lord, trying to live sinless. Yes. Huge difference. If you know yourself now, what decision will you make right now? Let's pray. Dear Father, too many times as Christians, we forget how holy you are, how we are to fear you, how our conversations, conduct of life, and our actual sayings should bring glory to you and get approval from you. We fall into temptations easily. We fall into sin because of our love for the world, the flesh, and the devil. Help us get right with you, Lord. Help us remember every single sin that we've committed that we haven't confessed. Truly getting right with you, Lord God. Fill us with the Holy Spirit, Lord. And help us to live a life where we don't sin because we don't have to sin, Lord. Just trusting in you and not trusting our self-righteousness or anything else, Lord. Because we're the light of the world right now, Lord God. And this is so dark and it's getting darker. And we have to make sure that we shine for you, Lord God. We can't do it on our own, but we can do all things through Christ, which strengthens us. But help us to keep it to heart. It's a serious matter. We can't continue on, not grow, and just digress and backslide continuously. I pray that you'll beat everyone. You know everyone's need, everyone's sinful ways. I pray that everyone gets right. We all get up and serve you better. And above all, even so come Lord Jesus. Bless the rest of the day, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.